Okay, so we are live with our fourth live streaming webinar. We've got Claude Garcia with us this evening. Uh, he's coming from ETH Zurich, the university in Switzerland. Um, he also has a company called, uh, he's the CEO of Inspire Strategy and Decisions. He's going to be talking to us this evening about uh, using games for systems change. Um, so Inspire, they use games to enable systems change uh, particularly with respect to socio-ecological systems. Claude's uh, an ecologist, uh, spe specializes in forestry. Um, so they have a particular facilitation uh, method and ne negotiation technique that uses games, uh, game design to represent the problems um, a particular group of people are having. Um, so they get them together, they use games to map out the, the system and uh, to Kind of reveal the the rules and try to find way ways forward. So he's used this uh, this technique, this method, um, in many different areas, particularly in the Congo Basin, but also in Latin America, different areas around the world. Um, so I'm going to let Claude take it off and uh, lead us through this presentation. It should, be, it should be about 30 minutes long. Unfortunately, it's not live, so it's pre-recorded. Unfortunately, you won't get a chance to ask questions but if you're watching on youtube you can post a comment below the video and we'll try and get back to you okay claude take it away yeah thank you josh and thanks for the opportunity to present my work at uh, at system innovation um i actually i i discovered you guys uh, through uh, the tweets that you were um um sending and i saw that you were using the exact same words i'm struggling with for the last five years what is resilience? How do you overcome resistance to change? How do you help people have an holistic approach to the, to the problems they're facing? So uh, it, thank you for the opportunity. And, um, and if I didn't say it, uh, happy Halloween to everybody. Uh, we had kids uh, coming for trick or treat. We see maybe we will be interrupted, maybe not, we'll see. Um, so what the image, I wanted to begin with this image of down on, on planet Earth because a good way to actually start conversations with stakeholders is simply to experience something that is beautiful, that inspires all, as a, a first step in thinking problems differently. And I thought it would be nice to begin this conversation with exactly the same feeling. It is beautiful in it. Um, there is a, you have a, you have a, a QR, score, uh, QR code here that you can scan if you want to go to some of the blogs and papers that uh, we'll present in more detail, some of the things that we'll be talking uh, here this evening. Okay, so I want to talk about how do we use games to change systems. Um, um, now, games is, a, games is a word that is important, but it, 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 it also creates a lot of problems. Um, there are many games out there. We all play games uh, um, and we also have ideas about what a game is and who should be playing games. Games are typically for kids, games are for leisure. Um, so it is bizarre to use then games for hard problems. Um, I don't use the word serious games. Um, I think nobody wants to play a serious games. <laughs> serious uh, I, I want people having fun because also it's part of the process of, of discovering new things and thinking in new ways. But still, people have recommended to me that I drop the word of games. I actually fight against that. They told me that it would be easier to present, I don't know, interactive simulations, participatory, exploratory workshops, and you name it. I think games, um, it, it is worth keeping that. Because it's it's what we do. It's it's how humans learn. It's how uh, we have evolved to learn through play. So and and playing games. We, we'll go into that. So how can we really use games for for changing systems in in, in uh, out there? And I want to begin the talk uh, with this tweet uh, earlier this month. Nestle and Procter and Gamble said publicly that they would miss uh, the targets uh, to reduce deforestation that they had set for 2020. Um, these targets were, they took the targets publicly uh, in 2010 under strong pressure by, by the civil society. Um, and 10 years down the line, they are 
um, recognizing that they are failing. They are not the only ones who have taken the pledge. All the big uh, agro-food industries, I'm talking Unilever, Mondelez, uh, Mars, they have all taken pledges. They all have, uh, they are sourcing products from tropical landscapes. They are all part of the problem of deforestation. They recognize that and they have decided to take steps. And apparently the steps they've taken don't seem to work, despite investing significant amounts of time, efforts, and reputation. And it's not only the companies that are having this problem. What you see here, the bond challenge, is a public initiative where the governments are making pledges to restore degraded lands and forests and woodlands. And as you can see the ruler in the, in the lower part of the, of, the, of the screen, the pledge is they want, they hope to restore 150 million of hectares by 2020, which is literally next year, next door, and uh, 350 million by 2030. Here again, the pledges have been publicly taken by the governments, and here again, we are not on track to meeting that target. Um, um, uh, it's not me saying that. We have, we are lucky that we have a lot of um, third parties um, uh, are having access to data. There is transparency, and we know that uh, the, the impact on the ground is not what we would like to see. Um, deforestation is still happening, it's still part of the supply chains. Uh, forest degradation is not reducing. On a, we, we might have, we have success stories locally, but the global pattern is, is not good. If you see this graph, this, this, this graph uh, uh, produced by the World Resources Institute, shows the evolution of, of tropical primary forest loss over the last 20 years. Now, it's a bit tricky. Um, primary forest is not all forests. There's only 30% more or less of forest on the planet that can be classified as primary. And forest loss is not deforestation. Tree cover loss is not deforestation. These are technical terms. But um, even if we, if we don't go into the details, if you look at this graph, you need to be very optimistic to pretend that we are reducing the rate of change, of land use change, and the rate of deforestation. The red thin line is a three-year moving average. It's not going down. And, uh, and, and, and we, you probably have this image in your, in your mind. It was tweeted, tweeted uh, this summer. Um, it also created a, 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 a small... Uh, a small discussion, small buzz, because it's not a recent picture. It's a picture that was taken in 2003 when uh, the fires in the Amazon were at its peak. But it resurfaced last summer when again the Amazon was on fire with a level of intensity comparable to what was happening 10 years ago. Um, and it was this summer in the Amazon, but it was then later in Angola, and then we, it was later in, uh, in Indonesia and Sumatra. Um, so. So we have companies making pledges, we have governments taking pledges, we have the civil society concern, and we are not meeting those targets. Do I need to talk about the IT targets and the climate uh, agreement? It's extremely unlikely that we're going to stay under the two degrees target of the Paris Climate Agreement. Okay, so all this is interesting, all this is surprising. It shows that it's difficult to have a systemic approach and, and change something at the global level. But I would like to draw attention to something. Um, two weeks ago, Air France made again another pledge. They said that they would offset the carbon of its domestic flights. And, and this, this represents a uh, um, you know, hefty sum of money and resources that they are going to, to, to put in order to do good. But if you look at the response uh, the social uh, media did to that uh, announcement, there was, so these are, these are in, Fran, in French, but uh, I don't need to translate because the only word in English is obvious, it's greenwashing. Now, this is a problem that all the companies and all the heads of the uh, corporate responsibility units have. Whenever a company is taking a stand on environmental issues, the, the notion of greenwashing is on everybody's lips. And I want to, uh, to, to, to come back to that. 
um, I don't know what's in the head of uh, the CEO of Air France. I don't know what's in the head of, of the CEO of Mars or what the people in Nestle uh, really think. I don't know. I don't know if they want truly to do good and to reduce deforestation and to make sure that their company doesn't contribute to make things worse or if they don't care and if they think it doesn't matter. I don't know and I cannot know. It, and it's not so important. This is what I wanted to represent with this, this, this simple table, two by two. The up, up there, it's what it, it is in people's head. So people either want the change or they don't really want it. Okay. But then what I can observe using remote sensing, using data analysis, is whether or not the system is changing. And here, either it's changing or it's not changing. The graphs I just showed you indicate that clearly we are not changing the pattern of deforestation. So we are in the lower part of the table. Things are not changing. But then it could be either people, the governments, the companies, the CEOs, the private individuals, they want change and it's not happening or they don't really care. And then it's not surprising it's not happening. Now, greenwashing belongs to that last category. People are making announcements. They have many reasons, but the reason is not because they want to change things. And without surprise, they are not putting enough money. They're not putting enough reputation. They're not doing what needs to be done. It's not surprising if in this case, the system is not changing. I am not interested in that category of stakeholders. These are not the ones I'm working with. These are not the ones I want to work with. I am interested in working with those that want change. And for whatever reason, this change seems to escape their strategies. They are doing things, they are investing time, money, resources, sometimes millions of dollars, and it doesn't seem to have an impact on the ground. Why is it important to work with these people? Because in this situation, a human being placed in the situation is in a state of suffering. A human being in that situation suffers from cognitive dissonance. They want something and their acts give them something else. Their acts are not in accordance with their values. This creates distress. This creates suffering. And I have done these presentations to the, to the head of the um, environmental responsibility units of big companies in France, and they were all nodding when I was saying that. Now, when somebody suffers from cognitive dissonance, um, we do all do things uh, to, to avoid that. Um, but the easiest thing to do is actually to change the values. It's easier to change the values than to change the things we're doing. If you change your values, you end up saying, listen, okay, this cannot work. I cannot save the planet. You know, okay, too bad. I and then I will lose this goodwill. That's why I'm focusing on the people that want to change and are not making it. So how can I help them? You could think that if you understand why we're losing tropical forest, it would be possible to develop strategies that work. Okay, so then I'm asking the question: Why are we losing forest in the tropics? Now. This question is crucial, but this question is old. And this question has been already answered. What you see here is a paper, is a figure published in 2002 um, by Geistan Lambert. You have the QR code that will take you directly to that paper. This diagram is a meta-analysis of more than 100 cases of tropical, documented tropical deforestation, and they identify the drivers. They explore the reasons why forest in these cases that we're looking at were being lost that table it's 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 colorful it's pretty it's a bit messy but it has a very strong structure and i walk you through the first line the first uh, squares in white are the direct drivers of tropical deforestation agricultural expansion is by far the, the most important one we have then infrastructure ex extension and wood extraction they they are of, of a minor importance. Um, and of course, they are all interconnected. 
So if you want to do timber extraction, you need to construct roads, and these roads might actually lead the way to agricultural expansion. And there are other factors, like fires, and that's it. But these are the direct drivers of tropical deforestation. On any place on Earth where you go, these three will be playing together. And if they happen, it's because there is a combination, complex and, and moving, of five factors, five family of factors. Demography, economy, technology, you are much more efficient with a bulldozer than with a machete. Political and institutional factors, and the elections in Brazil last year would be a case in point. Corruption is also a factor here. And finally, cultural and socio-political factors, whether or not uh, the public in Europe is turning uh, vegetarian or vegan is one such thing. Whether or not the value, the forest has intrinsic value, is sacred for, for your community, this belongs to that category. So see, you can go anywhere on earth. This figure tells you what do you need to look in order to understand why we, we are losing forest. So the question of why are we losing forest is all and has been fully answered. The values, the parameters will change, will fluctuate as events happen. Uh, the price of the oil will change. Uh, the elections will happen. Corruption will, will disappear. But essentially, the structure remains the same. That means that that question is not that useful to address the problem. People that are wanting to change the system, they know this, and still they are unable to change the system. That's really interesting for us as researchers. And this is what we understand is actually going on. In the, in the diagram I showed you earlier, there is something essential which is missing, and this is the agency of humans. Somewhere hidden in between all these arrows, um, you have humans that integrate the information they receive. They see if migrants are coming to their village. They see the prices of crops or how much they are being offered for uh, crude palm oil. They see whether or not they have a good relationship with the chief uh, or if they can trust that the, 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 the cooperative will be well managed. They see whether or not it's possible to continue selling bushmeat because uh, people in the city actually demand that. So they integrate all that information and then they produce a decision. They take a decision and they decide either to cut the trees or to plant the trees. And this is what creates the patterns. Yet agency, humans, are not obviously represented in the model I just show you. And this is a constant. We tend to, to, to forget what is the main actor. We live in the Anthropocene, and that means that the patterns that we are working with are essentially the result of decisions by humans. So how do humans make a decision? The image I, I, you see here, um, we present the structure of a multi-agent system. Multi-agent systems are derived from artificial intelligence. They were, um, this figure was actually first conceptualized in 1985, I think, by, by Jacques Ferber. And it was used to code uh, programs. We use that structure to represent landscapes. Um, and why? Because it has all the elements we need. Let me show you. We have, we have a landscape, uh, the blue square here. And that landscape can be simple or can be complex. It can have frontiers, it can have heterogeneity. On this landscape, there are resources, the cubes you see here, uh, pink, yellow, blue. Um, these resources can be, again, simple, or they can be complex, they can be dynamic. You can have more, they can grow, they can multiply, or they can be, uh, be non-renewables, they can be fossilized <laughs> within the landscape. So we have landscapes, we have resources on it, and then we have agents. Agents have the particularity that they have needs, they have desires, they have aspirations. They perceive the landscape and the resources, and then they can use and access the landscape and the resources to satisfy their needs. More importantly, they are not alone. They exist in a society of other agents, some of them identical to themselves, 
others will, will be different, with different aims, different means, and different needs. So this creates a society, and it's a very good representation of a social ecological system. Uh, I challenge you, look around you, and you can represent your room, your office, your classroom, the bar where you are listening to these, or the, the taxi, using this structure. But the most important part is that the agent here in the center, when she takes decisions on what resources to take, who to talk to, who to exchange resources and information with, she's making the, this decision not on the basis of what surrounds her, but only on the basis of what she perceives. And that's what we represent here with these, uh, with these uh, uh, square cartoon here. This, the Germans have a word for that, they call that the Umwelt. Umwelt is normally translated as the environment. It is actually the perceived environment. It means that if the stakeholder, if the agent doesn't perceive something, she will not make decisions accordingly. And departures between the, mo the mental model of the agent and the actual physical environment where she is in will explain and and, and, and determine the quality of the decision that the stakeholder is taking. In other words, this stakeholder who sees a pink landscape and is not aware that there are actually a fertile ground on dark blue and an unfertile sterile ground on the, dark, on the light blue might make decisions on where to plant trees, for example, in the light blue, which would be inefficient. Our job is not, therefore, to explore what are the values of the agent, what do they want, but what do they understand of the system. And our objective is to improve that understanding. Decisions taken by this second stakeholder will be better because more informed, with a better representation of the landscape, of the resources, of the society where she's interacting, and of herself. That's what we try to achieve with our games. And how do we do that? We simply invite people to think about the future. Thinking about the future is when you use the mental model you have of the system. Thinking about the future is what will I do tonight for Halloween? I need, or oh, it's Halloween, everybody expects me to be dressed as a zombie. Well, see, this is a mental model I have about society that tells me what I can expect to find and what the others will do. These expectations, that's what we use to talk about the future. Now, when, when the question is simple, uh, where should I go to, to get a glass of water? Um, it's, it's not very difficult to use the mental model. But when things are as complex as the diagram I showed you about deforestation in the tropics, the cognitive capacities of human beings um, are, are not sufficient. We have limitations. And it becomes very difficult to think things through. Um, I'm not even about uh, uh, 10 years or, or 20 years. I'm talking about next month. There are a lot of uncertainties and it's complex. So how do we help people think the future? This diagram represents more or less what we, what we try to achieve. It was published in 2014. On the left, we see the systems today. Here, it's a forest because I'm a forester. But if you're a marine ecologist, it could be a seagrass or a fisheries. If you are interested in, in, in I don't know, cocoa plantation, or if you're interested in a, in a, in a city and, how the, and the traffic jams in the city and the traffic flows in the city, or the energy consumption of a country, you could represent that equally. So you have the system today. And then you invite people to think how the system can evolve tomorrow. And this will lead to the description of different futures. And some of these futures will be positive for the stakeholders. They will like that story, or they will say, no, no, this I really don't like. But I have understood how I can reach there. And I have understood what I should do to avoid going to that, uh, to that, to that end. So it's really about thinking the future. Um, let me show you, uh, th this is very academic so right now, so let me show you an example. We're going to the Congo Basin, Central Africa, um, and we're going to a small country 
which is called the Republic of Cameroon. Um, it's, it's just there in the middle. And so the landscape looks like that. You can see there are roads, uh, fields, and between the roads are these big patches of dark green forest, which is used for logging concessions. Um, we, we were lucky that we had access to excellent data. Um, and, 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 and so you, what you see here is the evolution of the forest cover of that country in the last 50 years. Um, um, so as you see, it's the story of deforestation, which is, which is classic from the tropics, with some good news happening at the end of the story in 2010. Now, we ask uh, people, uh, and so we, we could look at all the things. We could look at the biodiversity uh, evolution. This story was also, we, we could see how biodiversity was being lost and how intact and sorry, vulnerable ecosystems were, were increasing. But see, what is interesting is that and I, I have presented that uh, already in, in, in another venue, uh, is that then we invited people to go back in time. Now you understand how we're going to do these things. And we ask them, if you're not happy with the future you created, um, why can't you do things differently? What would you do things, what would you do differently? And when you ask that question, um, and that's the result that you see here, on the left is the first timeline, and on the second, the second timeline, the same, the same stakeholders engaged, the same CEOs of logging companies, the same representatives of the ministries. So the same system, but a different behavior by the stakeholders leading to a different outcome, which is exactly what we want to achieve. Now, and the story is for forest cover, but it works equally well for biodiversity. On the left, the story, the first timeline, on the right, the second timeline. And you see here that they can still, uh, at the end, they can still decide to destroy uh, biodiversity and ecosystems, but that's a negotiated agreement between all stakeholders with compensation agreed upon by everybody. Look at the, look at the trend of the green lights, it's completely different. So understanding and knowing what was going to happen developing better mental models allow these, these stakeholders to completely erase the loss of biodiversity, which is the result of, I'm going to use a hard word, of stupid decisions. So what I have shown you is that the Republic of Cameroon achieved the forest transition uh, in, 90, in 1980, thanks to our time machine, entirely through voluntary agreements, without central planning, without the World Bank coming and telling them what to do. That's exactly what we want to achieve, what we seek to achieve. And that's exactly what uh, Nestle and Procter & Gamble are looking for. Of course, it's not a time machine and Cameroon is not a real republic. It is one of these games I've been told, telling you about in the beginning. These games that we have developed with stakeholders in the Congo Basin in different countries, in Cameroon, in Gabon, in DRC, we have spoken with local communities, governments, logging companies, they have told us what is their mental model of the system. They have told us what are the resources they manage, what are the stakeholders they work with. And we have transformed all that into rules and invited players to play. When you come and join at the table and you start playing the role of a logging company here, you take decisions that are remarkably similar to the decisions that an actual CEO is taking on the field. It becomes extremely useful because, uh, so what does it look like? It looks like that. So this, this is a one day workshop using the game that we have developed in the field. And uh, so this, this happened in the Netherlands uh, one year ago. And you can see as time goes by, they, they negotiate, they argue, they fight, and they transform the landscape. The landscape response to their decisions because there are environmental um, processes going on that are represented by the laws. Now see, this was done in the offices of Tropenbos International and essentially everybody around the table is working on the field of environment. But do you notice that when they play as logging companies, the landscape still ends up turning yellow, which is not good for the forest. This tells us a lot of things. It tells us, 
it's not the people that are uh, <laughs> that, that are to blame. It's the system. Anybody in that situation would probably do the same. This is extremely important. And therefore, if they want to avoid these yellow spreading over the landscape, they need help to identify the strategies that would work. What you see here is only the first game session. I don't show the second game session where there is much less yellow. What happens is that when they play, when they analyze, when they understand the strategies they've been taking, the reasons of the failure, the things they didn't look or contemplate or take into account, people who want to do good but couldn't, so people that were trapped down on the left, then identify strategies that work. This is how we help people to resolve their cognitive dissonance. This is how we help people that want their companies to do good to actually become effective. We don't give them the solutions. They find themselves the solutions one, once they've been placed in a situation where they can take a different vantage, vantage point, reflect on the strategies, see the problem from somebody else's perspective, essentially working on their mental model and their understanding of the system. We don't address the values. We don't impose our values on them. They are free to decide the pathway they want to take. There is an added benefit to that. Because as I told you, I'm not working on the people that do greenwashing, but these people, they exist, they will be looking. And there is a lot of effort to bring them to these in this direction, convincing them that the planet is important, convincing them that we need biodiversity, that forest matters, um, the Extinction Re uh, Rebellion movement is doing that, the marches for climate change and, and the, the, the addresses of Greta Thunberg to the United Nations are doing this. It's about changing the values of the people. But this is met with a lot of resistance. The bet I'm, I'm, we are making is that if people find strategies that are successful, that start changing the trends, that start reversing the deforestation pattern locally and globally, then, because they will be more efficient spending their money, those that don't care will also, through imitation, replicate the same behavior. And then they will find themselves in a situation of cognitive dissonance also, because they couldn't care less for the polar bear and the, and the bees, but look, they are saving them. I bet that people in this situation will actually find it cool to save the planet and they will end up in the same situation. So in, it's, about, it's about taking a path of least resistance to help the people to go to where we need to go if we are to achieve the targets of the Paris Agreement and make sure that our kids and grandkids have a nice planet to live in. Um, and I, I have a little bit of time and I would like to, to uh, explore some of the details in, in, in the picture you see here um, is um, I, I didn't want the people to be recognized um, because these are players that have failed in one of my game sessions. They were not happy about the outcome. They played again. They did worse. And this is extremely frustrating. It happens. And then the first response is the model is broken. The game is designed for me to lose. It becomes very difficult uh, then to overcome that barrier. And you can see the body language is very clear. Um, except that it is possible to look and show how other people have played. And then people, are, uh, the players that have, even those that have failed, discover that different forms of playing, different forms of strategies can actually solve the problems that get stuck. So it's not a problem of the system. It's not a problem of the game. They simply didn't find a nice strategy or a creative strategy to overcome the problem. It really um, is a powerful uh, 
lesson for the people that undergo this process. It can be a bit painful, um, but it really is enlightening. And one of the things players in the game I showed you about the Congo Basin really hate is this one. One of the actions they can do is planting trees. You've heard about planting trees all summer. So um, you were expecting this. <laughs> so in that game, as a logging company, you can create roads, you can build roads, you can log, you can sell, but you can also plant trees. And the first response players have when they see the landscape turn yellow is to actually invest significant amounts of resources and money to plant trees. And it doesn't work. And, and the cells continue turning yellow. Sometimes it works, but most of the time it doesn't. And then they experience a lot of frustration. And then they are in this situation of cognitive dissonance I was talking about. And then they stop planting because it doesn't work. And, and then they say, okay, to hell with everything. And my business is to cut the forest. It's precisely that we want to avoid. What they don't realize until we describe this in the system is that there is a hidden variable in the game. Every cell, the color of the cell represents the forest cover. If it's yellow, there are less trees. If it's dark green, there are more trees. But there is a hidden variable which cannot be measured and that's the potential forest cover, which is reduced when we build roads and when we build crops. So every time they build roads, not only do they reduce the forest cover, they also reduce the potential forest cover. And if they are planting trees when there is no potential, they are wasting their money, they are wasting their resources, they are taking a stupid decision. When they see this, the players slap their, their, their heads and say, how could, how, how could we not think that? This summer, if you heard about tree planting, it's because with, with my colleagues, Jean-Francois Bastard and Tom Crowther and the others, we published a paper called The Global Tree Restoration Potential. This has nothing to do with games. This is classical ecological research, beautiful ecological research, but it precisely indicates to the global community what is the tree restoration potential so people don't start planting where they cannot. Now, the response we, we got was overwhelming. We, there is a lot of margin of error. If, I come, if, if these were not curves for a game, but for the planet, the, there is a significant gap between the, the real curve, the, the light green, and the potential one. We can plant an area as large as the United States. So there's a lot of room. But that doesn't, uh, that doesn't change the fact that both curves are in a downward spiral. So tree planting, even if successful, will only close the gaps between these two curves. It will not reverse the trend. We need tree planting, we need to bring back forest, but we need to do more. We need to stop deforestation. And that requires that we get many more people thinking on the future using the methods that I have shown you. Um, one of the difficulties we're having uh, is that um, this, Eisenhower, uh, this Eisenhower matrix is a, is, a, is a mantra for management. It's what a manager should do when uh, he or she has too much in, in, the, in, the, in their plate. If things are not urgent, they, they, they will plan action or eliminate. Now, nobody can actually claim the problem is not urgent. The environmental crisis is here. Nobody dares saying it's no longer urgent. So we are in the urgent column. But as long as the CEOs, as long as the governments, as long as the, the people making decisions do not consider it important enough for them to start taking the decisions, they will simply delegate. And that's how you create corporate responsibility units. We, we don't need corporate responsibility units. We need the business unit. We need the CEOs to actually take these issues in, uh, in, into their hands. So 
the games that I have shown you change the way participants consider the system, they change the way they understand the system, the other players and themselves. As long as it stays for, as a training exercise, it's not going to change anything. But if you bring at the table the people with decision power, so not the interns, but the CEOs, it is possible to change the way they will make decisions later on. We did that in 2017 with FSC. FSC had agreed in 2014, that's what you see here, to protect intact forest landscapes within FSC certified forest in the Congo Basin. FSC is, is one of the largest forest certification uh, entities. Two years after, sorry, two years after in 2016, in the Congo Basin, they were still struggling to define how to manage these large intact forest landscapes. Thanks to our game, in only three days, the participants could understand each other better and draft an agreement. And this agreement is today in force. It was ratified in April 2018 as it, and is still in force. The other, to my knowledge, um, the discussion on the intact forest landscapes in Russia, Canada, or Brazil have not managed to secure an agreement so far. But maybe, maybe, maybe I'm wrong and, uh, and that can be checked. But the Congo Basin, the negotiators in the Congo Basin, logging companies, governments, NGOs, conservation NGOs, and uh, local communities found an agreement that worked for them through the process of going through a game analyzing what it meant and then agreeing on how to change the system. Um, so if I go back to the beginning, why is Nestle and Procter & Gamble failing? First is because they don't, we don't necessarily, we, look, we are afraid of an ecological transition, but we don't necessarily realize that the transition that needs to happen is social, not ecological. More importantly, is because the models that we are using to think on the system, supply chains, um, uh, ecological processes, um, economic models, they do not place the agency of humans at the core of it. We say the forests are burning. They're not burning. Humans are setting fire to the forest. You don't treat the problem equally if you don't identify the root source of the problem. Agency, free will, and the capacity to take decisions needs to be at the core of the strategies we are developing for the bond challenge and for the large companies and for the small farmers. And finally, because we need to develop strategies and not plans, you plan when you have control over the system. In this case, none of the actors has full control over what's going on. The day the elections change who is ruling, the entire strategy developed by the logging company or by the, by the agri-food uh, industry needs to be revised. So we need to have strategists and not planners. Many of these elements have been already presented in a TED talk uh, um, uh, given in Zurich last year. And you can have a look at these. But what all this tells me is that there is a window of opportunity now that we can take world leaders and invite them to discover these methods. If they learn about these methods, if they are seen using these methods to make decisions, it will be very easy to actually percolate. The more people go through these learning processes, the, the better the quality of the decisions that we will collectively take. Because these problems, these wicked problems, they will require in collective intelligence. I will finish with that. Um, how do we get the attention of somebody like Melinda Gates? Um, I honestly don't know. Um, she, she's one of the most powerful women <laughs> on earth. Um, she's extremely busy. Um, she, I honestly I, I don't know. But we're going to try. Because uh, we are going to organize a session next July uh, 2020, 2020 is a, is a crucial year for forest. There is a world conference on nature uh, in May in Marseille. There is uh, the leaders uh, roundtable at the United Nations in September. 
and then there is a, the conference of the parties in Kuming in October. So next year is a crucial year because we will need to revise all the strategies that have failed and we will, we will need to revise and create the post-2020 strategies. So next July, by the shores of Lake Com, we are inviting 20 world leaders, CEOs, activists, opinion leaders, men and women that have all taken a stand to change how things are going for the better. We are inviting Melinda Gates. We, we, we invite them to discover these tools and to propose solutions, new solutions, to the problem of deforestation. Three days to change the way we save the forest. You can go and have a look at here. Um, it's completely crazy. We, we, we have been having the, we have been toying with the idea for a while and we just decided to actually go live yesterday. Um, we have no support, we have no funds. Uh, it's completely crazy, but we need all the help. We really think this can actually be a game changer. Um, and of course, um, we started with Melinda Gates. We wanted a, a, a woman to begin with. Um, but, you know, sometimes um, the world decides otherwise. And just yesterday, we found out that Elon Musk also took an interest on forests and tree planting, donating one million to the cause. We, we don't want one million. We want three days of Elon Musk. And we were wondering, how do we get the attention of Elon Musk? And, and well, we know that when he started SpaceX, he only had mariachis. We don't even have mariachis, but we have games that can be a game changer. So uh, follow us, join us. Um, we need all the supports we can get. I, I like it. I like it. Games, games can be a game changer. Huh? That's, a exactly. good, that's a good one. Yeah. Um, exactly, Josh. It's it's really interesting. It would have been good to kind of dig more into the details of how you make those games. I mean, it's fascinating that it just looks like it's very simple rules. Like the way you demonstrate it was information, resources, people, or the stakeholders' decisions. Yeah, just kind of those four and the, I guess the underlying resource, yeah. It's very, very simple kind of rules and and then people can play. I guess it kind of has to be so that people can kind of make sense of what's going on and they can play with them. Yes. Um, so uh, I, yeah, I think the point you made at the end was good also that it only really has relevance when people accept that you know, no one can kind of understand the whole thing and make the decision and they're all interdependent and then they have to get around the table and, uh, you know, explore collaboratively what are the possibilities. Um, but yeah, go on, what were you going to say? Um, no, 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 but you, you just said, uh, see, we will not, we, a technological fix is not going to save the planet. Um, uh, uh, a powerful individual is not powerful enough <laughs> to control that. Uh, we really need collective intelligence, but that, the good news is it's our most, it's our strong point. Mm -hmm. We are here today where we are because and collectively we're intelligent. Yeah, and games are such a good way to get that out there because they use other aspects to our strength in terms of visual information, in terms of tactile playing playing with things with our hands and also social there's a social aspect too isn't there that you're there and you're, play, you're playing with other people yeah. I, I mean it'd be just amazing to see like you know politics done like this right politics should be done like that shouldn't it like if you it, could it figure really, out it yeah. would be so much better than the discussions we see in the <laughs> so, so much more constructive exactly yeah i mean i guess the question then is like how do you transpose those ideas into other spheres like economics <clears throat> so i guess it's relatively kind of when you're dealing with something tangible like you know logs and trees and so forth it's mm. probably simple and when you're doing with economics and mm. you know society and so forth and how do you kind of take those same games and transpose them in other areas have you thought about that at all or well e economics are part of the systems mm. we have we have developed a game for example on on we're talking about the Amazon. We have a game about the soya cultivation. Uh, so soya, beef, corn uh, in the Amazon and the Cerrado and the connection with the markets, the domestic markets in Brazil, the markets in Europe and in China. Mm. So economics is essentially a relationship between mm. people about resources. So it's yeah. the core of most of our models. There are 
ecological processes and landscapes, and then there are vertical supply chains. Mm -hmm. Economics is not, it's absolutely no secret to integrate mm -hmm. that in the, yeah. in, the, in, the, in, the, in the in the games. Uh, the trickier one is the social uh, components, but the social components is represented by the fact that the players form a society. They are human beings, they have their reputations, they have their emotions, they have their values. Some of them want things, some others don't want. Some of them respect the others, others don't. And that's on, you, you play on that. Mm. We, we, were, we were playing yesterday uh, with the Earth, Earthworm Foundation in, um, in Switzerland, and we actually created a situation by which powerful players could talk to each other simply because they were sitting next to each other. Mm. So it's easy to represent frictions in the landscape or uh, social networks playing with the arrangement of the of the of the game actually mm -hmm. um, and i guess you can think about like taking into a social domain you can think about like social capital no because that's kind of what you're dealing with like ecological capital economic capital yes. social capital you can kind of transpose that across different domains but the other point you made about uh, putting human agency at the center like I think that's so much of the value of this, it, isn't it? That when you play, when you put the game in the middle there and the rules and everything, everyone feels like, you know, it's out there, it's possible to change those things. Yes. And you, you get that agency, you kind of, yeah, you reignite that agency, don't you? Um, and, it, and it is that putting that agency at the center so that people feel like they can, can change things. And, and, and see, you have statements, you have people that have been working on this, issues for, for like 25 years, I've used their reports to design my games. They play and they say, oh, Claude, there's nothing new here, but it suddenly is all different. Everything now suddenly makes a different sense. Mm. Because one thing is, you know, the, the understanding, the knowledge that you gain in the books and in the reports and mm. in the PowerPoint presentations. Mm. But the other one is the experience you have. And the game connects both because you are not happy when you are crossed by your, by your neighbor and you have the feelings of triumph, frustration. Mm. So it actually, what this does is it gives meaning to what you already know. Mm. As I told you, the questions, they have, they've been answered. We know why it's happening, mm. but we give it meaning. Mm. We make things important. Yeah. And then people say, oh, but it's my decision that actually made that. I could take a different decision. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, that's it. And um, I guess part of the challenge would be to get the right rules for the different situations you're going to be making the game for. No, there must be a lot of. It, it, to me, it seems like a lot of work must go into that. No, like figuring out what are those rules, what is the situation we're dealing with here. Uh, yes, yeah. yes, um, it, it, that's fieldwork. That's uh, that's our that's our expertise as researchers and as 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 practitioners of that. We go to the field. We these are we develop these games with the stakeholders. It's called participatory modeling. Companion modeling is actually the name of the method. Um, so you, you sit with them, you ask them questions, they respond, and then then you start developing the holistic uh, uh, view that they have, mm. and then you connect with what the other stakeholders know, and you put everything together, mm. and then there is a phase of validation where the same people play the game and through playing they tell aha uh -huh, yes these are my problems or these no you didn't understand that correctly it doesn't work like that mm. or oh this is new to me and they can also learn mm. Mm. so there is, there is an entire phase where the model needs to be developed and it's only when people say yes this is my problem then we can use it for exploring potential solutions yeah yeah and i guess the the other big part of it is the feedback loop isn't it the way they're playing with things they see what the outcomes are and then they can play with them again and see what the outcomes are from that and you get that kind of iterative kind of evolutionary process going don't you yes. and that's that's the other kind of i think that's the other kind of powerful element in the whole thing too there's a, it brings in a number of yeah really powerful elements elements i think i think that's one of them that the agency thing is the other and kind of having the rules out there the rules of the game yeah. and having a yeah a game that everyone could see what it looks like too i think each one of those is a really powerful aspect that seems to be lacking from a lot of kind of traditional methods but games 
bring it into play and also the physical aspect to it. It's not just rational talking, sitting in a chair. Um, yeah, so many, so many aspects to it. I like um, something I want to explore more in the future. Thanks a lot for sharing that with us, uh, Claude. It was really fascinating. And um, yeah, thank you very much. Let's, uh, let's wrap up there. Yes, thank you. Thanks for that. And, and I will play soon.